Guys, welcome back to the Relaxed Running Podcast. I'm Tyson Popplestone, your host here today. Now, just as a little bit of clarity, uh, we like to mix things up a little bit here. Some weeks I'll have a guest from a, a field in the distance running world, whether it's a physio, an athlete, a coach, uh, an exercise physiologist, dietitian, whatever. And uh, sometimes I'm gonna walk you guys through uh, some things that I've learned along the journey myself. I think one of the most helpful things in the, in the distance running scene is, is just having the capacity to be able to share with people what worked, what didn't, uh, what you've noticed along the way. It's, uh, it's some really good food for thought because especially for new distance runners out there, one of the most overwhelming things in any field uh, is, is just trying to figure out where to start. Okay, what do I need? What's sort of uh, a, a little bit of extra overkill um, versus what is the essential? So I wanted to answer some of the most commonly asked questions amongst distance runners. I've put out some uh, little queries myself. I've also done a little bit of research as to uh, what are the biggest questions that brand new runners have. So depending on time, we'll walk through about eight to 10, maybe a couple more of, of these questions. Just so, that especially if you're a brand new runner, it can put your mind at ease. It can just help point you in the right directions. If you guys, <clears throat> if you still have any questions once this podcast is done, make sure you, uh, you, you jump onto YouTube and you, you whack them down in the comments below. If you're listening to this, if you're on YouTube already, just whack them in the comments below. Uh, if you uh, um, have more of a preference for Instagram or something like that, just jump on Instagram and shoot all your questions to relaxed running and, uh, and I'll make sure we get back to you there. Uh, like anything though, there's there's going to be more questions to ask than I answer today, but this is simply a, a, a little bit of a start point for you. <clears throat> Excuse me. I uh, hope you're all doing well. Uh, things here in Queenscliff are, are going pretty well. I've been getting back into some heavier kind of running, not heavier, but uh, a little bit more consistent running the last couple of weeks. I've always got my finger in the field a little bit just by default of, of what I do. But, uh, but also just getting out there and actually doing the running has been nice. I'm still discovering a whole heap of new trails, still discovering a whole heap of new paths around here. I, uh, for anyone familiar with this part of the world, I, I love, I'm in Queenscliff right now. <clears throat> I love running down towards the, the Point Lonsdale Lighthouse back up this way. It's, a, it's about a 7K run, it seems to be my go-to. So if you've got any recommendations, make sure you let me know. Uh, guys, if you are enjoying this podcast, before we get into it, do me a favor, jump on over to the Apple iTunes, Apple, Apple Podcasts, sorry, and leave a little review. It just really helps uh, this podcast reach more people. I think at the moment we've had like 56 ratings and, uh, and there's plenty of nice comments down there. So it would mean the world if you jump over and, and just leave a nice little review and, uh, and just let us know what aspects of the show uh, you're enjoying. If there's anything that you would like to see on here, make sure you just hit me up personally. Uh, either through Relax Running on YouTube or just via Instagram. But with all that said, let me get into some of the most commonly asked questions that brand new distance runners or just runners who are trying to get involved in, you know, the sport of keeping fit have. Did that make sense? I don't know. I think you know what I was trying to say. All right, question one. The most popular question. Uh, what am I supposed to wear? So it's weird as well. It's a funny question because with a, a sport like running, you think, okay, it's very simple. I need like a shirt, I need some shorts, I need some shoes. And essentially, that they're the go-tos. They're the, the real crucial things that you need. But uh, what, what's the material supposed to be made out of? What kind of shoes do I wear? How much should I spend? Um, what are the added bonuses as to what I should wear and what should just be forgotten about? So. Let me walk you through a few things that, that I wear, and uh, I've been around distance runners for sort of 20 years now, and I can give you some real solid feedback on, on what most of these guys and gals uh, are running. Uh, the first point of, of call, and I reckon the most important reference point for, for you to consider, is your, is your shoes. So if you're pretty keen to get involved in running seriously, you wanna run a few days a week, maybe, maybe more than that, you wanna find a, a particular shoe that fits your foot. So, what that means is different people have, have different structures of, of feet. Some people are relatively flat foot, some people have little arches, some people have higher arches. Uh, some people roll in a lot when they run, some people roll out a lot when they run. And depending on our sort of anatomy, the way that our foot hits the ground is very different from person to person. Now, the reason that matters is <clears throat> obviously because 
when we're putting persistent or consistent pressure on a particular part of our foot or body, um, that persistent and consistent pressure, it, it can start to build up. It can start to create a few little hot spots. So what we're looking for in a shoe is not only cushioning, but we're looking for a particular shoe that supports the kind of foot that we have. So you don't need to spend hundreds of dollars to do this. If you've got an athlete's foot near you, they'll give you an entry level guide as to what you should be looking for in a, in a shoe. Uh, they'll get you on the treadmill, they'll get you just uh, recording a few strides and it'll give you a bit of an idea as to how your foot lands, it'll give you a bit of an idea as to which part of your feet and legs might build up a little bit of weakness. And depending on that, you're either gonna get a neutral shoe uh, or a shoe with some arch support on the inside or maybe even some shoes with a heavier support around the outside. You don't wanna guess your way through that. If you're only running sort of once or twice a week and you're not running very far, I wouldn't even stress too much about that. But if you're really keen just to get it right, uh, you can go to Athlete's Foot. If you wanna spend a bit more, check out your local podiatrist and, uh, and they'll really fit your foot well, find out any potential weaknesses that you might have. I, I personally, uh, right now I'm running in a pair of Adidas shoes. Uh, for, for years though, I've run in Asics, I've also worn Nike. I'm not that loyal to any one particular brand when it comes to footwear. I, I just want a shoe that feels really good. Uh, usually, I, I've got flatter kind of feet, but for the amount of running that I'm running uh, at the moment, it doesn't make a huge difference to me. So the shoe that I'm running, I can't even think of the name of it. It's more of a neutral shoe. If I start building that up, you know, uh, in terms of how many Ks and miles I'm running in the next few months, then I'll, I'll probably look a bit more seriously into what shoes I could get. But I would say shoes, are obviously, they're the most important part because they can actually help us uh, prevent injury, help us prevent little niggles and stuff kicking in. So spend a little bit of time. Don't get too caught up on having to spend 250 bucks either. Uh, more expensive shoes don't always equal better shoes. If you, if you wanna save a little bit of cash, find out from the podiatrist what shoe you need, and then have a look at last season's model. Usually, just because they're not the, the hottest right now, you can save yourself you know, 80 or 100 bucks. Um, and if you're clever about it and go to a shop like Rebel Sport, they price match with a lot of online stores. So check that out. When it comes to shorts, when it comes to shirts, uh, and when it comes to other running clothing, I'm a big fan, and uh, full disclosure, they're a sponsor of, of this podcast, but Rundy's Undies, athletic underwear are a, a really like their favorite part of my wardrobe i don't just say that because they are a sponsor i uh, always just give the prelude that they're a sponsor because i love them so um, they're just a comfier running underwear they're light they're they're really breathable they're really comfortable um you can get those at, at rundies.com.au uh, <clears throat> when it comes to shorts and shirts i've got items in my clothes uh, in my closet that are some of it are from Kmart for like 10 bucks and, and I love them. I've got a few shirts that I constantly run in from Kmart. Um, I've got, uh, actually I've just, I've recently, I, I don't know, I think I lost them or I've thrown them out. I had a pair of shorts that I ran in for years uh, that were eight bucks from Kmart, really comfortable, like a nylon kind of material. The only tip I'll give you is just steer clear of cotton. Cotton gets really heavy. It's uncomfortable when you sweat. It's uncomfortable when, you, when it gets really wet. Um, it's a bit chafy or chafy, chafy as well. If you want to spend a little bit more, uh, I, I'm a really big fan of Lululemon. I've got a couple of Lululemon pairs of shorts, uh, which are really nice. They're light. As I said about the Rundies, undies, they're, they're breathable, they're comfortable. Uh, but honestly, just find a fabric that feels comfortable on you. I like light, I like breathable. They're the two main components I'm looking for. If it ticks that box, I, I don't care whether you're paying 80 bucks for it or 10 bucks for it. It really doesn't bother me. So. Um, uh, honestly, I've got I've got a shirt in my in my wardrobe right now. I've given it to my wife recently because she prefers it. It was eighty bucks. I just don't like it. It's just uncomfortable. My Kmart ten dollars shirts uh, work a treat. So they're the real essentials. Now, when it comes to the the added little things that you might want to get, uh, a running watch is a really good start. Garmin are probably cream of the crop for amongst a, a lot of athletes. They I always prefer in a Garmin. Again, I, I'm a little bit. Not stingy, but I'm just cautious with, with how sucked in I get to technology. So for a bloke like me, I prefer simple. With my watches, I'll go, uh, okay, does it tell me how long I've been running for? Will it tell me how far I've ran? And will it tell me my kilometer splits? If it can do those three things, I'm pretty happy. Now, until recently, I, I was running with a watch which was about seven years old. It was like a turquoise color. I'm pretty sure it was a girl's watch. Um, it, it basically did the trick. The last couple of months, I haven't been, I haven't been running with a watch at all. but. If you wanna get involved in that, just find those three basics. They're essentially all you're gonna need in terms of running watches. 
Uh, if you struggle with blisters as well, Steigen socks are, are, are a really highly renowned brand. They're, they're not affiliated with this show at all, uh, but they're really well respected amongst a lot of athletes. And if you've constantly struggled with, with blisters, recommend that you check those guys out. I think you'll be a really big fan. Uh, they're, they're the essentials. You don't need much more than that in your, in your toolkit. Uh, if you can start there, everything else is, is pretty much bells and whistles. They all get a little bit more exciting. Um, or, or they're all like the add-ons after that. So in my cupboard, you won't find too much more than that. All right, the second question which is constantly asked amongst new runners is, okay, when I'm training, is it okay if I walk? Am I allowed to, if I get tired, can I walk? The answer is absolutely 100% yes. You can, you can walk. You don't need to get too stressed about that. Now, I understand the question. Whenever you start something new, the goal is a lot of the time, you just wanna get out there and you wanna, you wanna do what you see people doing. People on TV, they make it look easy. The people who have been running for a while make it look really easy as well. But the truth is, you, you can walk. If you, if you need a walk, you can walk. Now, in fact, one of the things that I'll often tell athletes that I'm working with is it's actually good to walk. Or if you're trying to learn how to run for, for longer, simply run at a pace you'd be super embarrassed to be seen running at. Maybe that's just the pace that you're running at already, I don't know but then slow it down even more. One of the biggest mistakes that new runners make is they'll go out and they're like, okay, I guess this is the pace that I run. I'll just, I'll just keep rocking around this pace. And then naturally you get to about a kilometer in and if you don't know how to gauge that pace, you're gonna be exhausted. So I always laugh with my wife because I'm obviously a better runner. Not bragging, I've just done it for longer. Um, it's just more natural to me. I, uh, but we'll go for a run and even with all my experience, the fact I can kick her butt in a race She'll still wanna run faster than me for the first one or two Ks, and she'll always get to two Ks, and she'll be like, babe, I'm so unfit, I don't know why I even thought to run with you. And I'm like, no, no, it's the constant story. You've just started way too fast. So I say, hey, just walk for a little bit, really slow that jog down a little bit, and then when you're comfortable, when you've got your breath back, get back into it. So if you knew 100% you should rest, in fact, on the Relax Running uh, Distance membership, our brand new programs are, are all about alternating walking with running. So you might wanna go out, you'll jog for uh, 10 seconds, you might walk for 20 seconds. You'll jog for 10 seconds, walk for 20 seconds. You can repeat that for, for 20 minutes or however long you're comfortable. Until you get more comfortable just incorporating a few jogs, just keep doing that walk in between. It really doesn't matter. And then as you get fitter, gradually increase the amount that you're jogging decrease the amount that you're walking. Before you know it, if you're consistent, it'll just spring up on you. You'll be running 20 minutes, 30 minutes, fairly uh, fairly consistently. I'm honestly, I'm more than happy to guide you with that. So if you're not on the Relax Running Forum yet, jump on. The, the address for that is forum.relaxrunning.com. Shoot me a message when you're on there and, and I'm more than happy to give you a little bit of practical guidance as to how to take those steps in, in improving how far you can jog versus how far you can walk. All right, third question. Often a really overwhelming and highly debated subject. I actually made a YouTube video on this. Uh, it's all about how, how should I breathe when I run. Okay, a really, really uh, debated topic. As I've said, a lot of people are gonna disagree with what I'm about to say, and I frame that because I've recently changed a, a little bit of my view on this after reading James Nestor's book, um, Breath. Uh, I had James Nestor on the Relax Running podcast a while ago. And he was speaking about the, the impact of nose breathing. See, our goal isn't just to get more and more and more oxygen in. A common misconception is obviously the more oxygen we get into our body, the fresher we'll feel. But so often when we get tired, when we run, it's not because our body is completely starved of oxygen. Uh, uh, like a pulse oximeter will often show that even in those moments where we feel puffed and tired, our, our oxygen levels in our blood are still quite high. But the problem is, uh, due to a buildup of CO2 in our blood, uh, we feel as though we're really lacking that oxygen. And I say all that because James Nestor, through a uh, scientific study that he looked at over you know, the last 120 years of science that exists around this subject, and also anecdotal evidence from his own life, uh, doing some personal studies for a couple of weeks, came to the conclusion that nose breathing ideally is the best form of breathing. Now, don't run away when you hear that because I've had two sinus surgeries due to blocked sinuses. My sinuses were constantly blocked. Nose breathing wasn't, op wasn't an option for me years ago, uh, but it can be developed. And he says, just like our abs can be developed with consistent use, 
uh, our, our sinuses, the actual tissue in our scientists, in our scientists, in our sinuses can be strengthened, developed, and broadened, uh, and enabling it to be easier for us to breathe. He says that the best thing about us breathing through our nose is that actually, when we've learned to do it well, it, it delivers a better quality oxygen to our blood. So you're just getting more air through our lungs, through our mouth. Uh, you know, we can get direct uh, oxygen, but a lot of the time it's cold air. It's uh, it's really not stale air, but it's it's just straight to the source, straight into the lungs. It can't be warmed up. It can't be purified, and therefore all that oxygen isn't being absorbed. Whereas through our nose, if we can warm it up a little bit, if we can purify it, um, we can absorb that oxygen more effectively. So I uh, really encourage you, if you want to go into more depth with this and, and research it a little bit more, check out James Nestor's book called Breath. Check out the episode on the Relax Running podcast that I did with him. He breaks it down far better than I just did. Uh, but he also gives you a lot of hope as to how you can strengthen that ability to breathe through your nose. A lot of us have allergies that we're not aware of. A lot of us just don't breathe through our, our, our nose at all because we've become such habitual mouth breathers that the idea of even nose breathing just seems impossible. But <clears throat> uh, one thing that I've started to incorporate into, into my nights is now when I go to sleep, I tape my, my mouth up, which sounds extreme if you're not used to it. Uh, but the reason for that is it just forces you to breathe through your nose through the night. And through consistency, I, I can I can promise you that in my own life, I've, I've noticed my sinuses open up um, and, and I'm really working on incorporating that into my uh, my day-to-day -day runs. Don't do everything at once though. Like you might want to just start by practicing through the nights, uh, breathing through your nose, then incorporating into some walks and then just gradually incorporating into some of your slow jogs. Don't just jump out if you've got a big session or a race tomorrow and try and nose breathe because it's going to have really bad consequences. You're not going to feel great doing that. All right, question four, really common question as well. What if I feel self-conscious when I run? You're going to. You're 100% gonna feel self-conscious. Just like me, when I was learning to touch type on a computer, I felt ridiculous, I felt stupid, I didn't know how to do it, I didn't know where to put my fingers. My mates around me would tease me because I just looked so silly trying to do it. But with practice, with consistency, with time, uh, not only does your confidence increase, but your ability to do it well gets better. Uh, depending on how confident you are and how self-conscious you might be as a person when it comes to physical exercise, that's going to play a role in uh, you know how much of an impact uh, you know self-conscious, how much of an impact you're going to be uh, you know the, the perceptions of what you think people are thinking about you. Did that make sense? Might have on your ability to get out the door and run. But I'll say with uh, absolute certainty, you're going to feel self-conscious. So just accept that fact really soon, uh, and, and just know that it's better off. Armchair critics are, are the worst. It's so easy for anyone to sit at home and commentate on what people should be doing, when they should be doing it. I do it every year at the Australian Open. Commentate on all the faults in people's techniques and what they should be improving. I would get my ass kicked playing tennis though. So um, it's so easy to do what I do with the tennis. Don't be that person. Get out there, you know, put, uh, put your shoes on and just force yourself to get involved in it. It's one of the things I learned when I started stand-up comedy a couple of years ago as well. It's a... Uh, it's the most brutal form of judgment and I just had to deal with it. So I can probably relate to exactly how you feel more than you can imagine because I've stood up in front of a room full of people and just been judged not only because I feel like I'm doing badly but because I'm actually <laughs> doing badly. But it, the beauty for you guys in the running world is you don't have to do it in front of people. You can go and find a hidden track, you can go and find a quiet oval, you can run really early in the morning, you can run late at night. If it's that much of an issue, you can work around it. But I would encourage you, hey, just pull that bandage off and go and run in front of a heap of people. Just get used to it. Truth is, people aren't looking at you like you probably think they are. And if they are, who cares? It's like my mum told me when I was seven. It's their issue. It's not yours. Put it this way. I've been in the sport 20 years. I've seen the best runners in the world. I've seen uh, the most overweight runners trying to get around a tan. Uh, tan's the botanical gardens here in Melbourne. I, I couldn't look twice. I would not I would not care less. So from a person who's run at a pretty high level, we're not looking at you. We're too busy thinking about ourselves. So it's <laughs> probably just the same as you. So we're all in the same boat there. We're all thinking that everyone else is looking at us. We're not. We're, uh, we're, we all think everyone else is looking at you is what I was trying to say. We're not. We're thinking about ourselves. That might just show how vain I am. Maybe that's just me. But hey, pull that band-aid off and just get out there and, and do it. Okay, uh, six, I kind of covered this. I kind of covered this a little bit in one of the earlier questions. How fast should you be running? Now, the truth is, depending on what your actual goal is with your running is gonna vary the answer to that question. So, 
If you're brand new to running and you're just trying to get fit and you're just trying to learn how to run, the answer is slower than you feel is slow. So go out at a slow pace. If you're embarrassed, slow down even more. It's a great place to start. Once you start to feel a little bit more confident, once you start to get a little bit more fit, you're gonna to start to introduce different forms of training. So you won't just be doing long, slow jogs. You'll also start to do some interval training. You'll start to do some fartlek training. You'll start to do some, some threshold kind of running. If, if you jump on to Relax Running, I've got a free 10K training resource there. And the reason I mention that is because if you download that, you'll get a little bit of a guide which will give you a pace chart and it'll also give you a little bit of a monitor as to how fast each of your runs should be. So your easy runs are done at about a three out of 10 effort level. Your fartlek runs can be up at around a five or six out of 10 effort level. Your intervals can be about a six to seven out of 10 effort level. But if you want some more structured guidance, go to relaxrunning.com, click on free resources and download the 10K training program. Even if you don't want to run a 10K, the guide to that 10K has uh, various definitions of all the different kinds of training you're going to do and a guide as to how fast those particular runs should be. So that would be a really good place to start. If you're brand new to it though, the answer is just very, very slow. All right, next question, do I eat before I run? <clears throat> so here's what I do. And I say what I do because uh, depending on who you speak to, there's there's a lot of different advice on what you should be doing in, in terms of diet. Like some people are big fans of a ketogenic style diet where your main fuel source is the is the fat energy in your body. And then you have others whose main fuel source is, is carbohydrates. So depending on where you fit into that scene, I'm, I'm more on the carb side at the moment, even though I've heard some really good evidence and had some really good chats even on this podcast with people who recommend the ketogenic diet. I've just been a little bit slack in trying it out. I'm not really training for anything seriously at the moment. So I'm just doing what works for me. So essentially, let me work, let me work, uh, sort of say if I'm running at 9 a.m., I'll give you a bit of an idea of what I do. And that could just give you a little bit of food for thought, pardon the pun, as to what you might be able to do with your own running. So my last snack will usually be about an hour before I actually get out the door and go for a run. That's it, it's usually something quite light, like a, a little bit of toast. I have brown bread, uh, just with, I'll, I'll usually have like Vegemite or a bit of honey on those two pieces of toast about an hour before. But three hours before or four hours before, I might have something a little bit more substantial. So my main breakfast, which is a smoothie, I might have at, I probably wouldn't have at, if I was running an early morning run at 9 a.m. Uh, but say if it was a race, I might get up at five or six and I would have that smoothie just so it has a little bit of time to digest. Uh, another popular meal in my books, which has got an interesting reputation in terms of how it sits with people, is oats. It's, it's obviously very high in fiber, which can create a few toilet troubles if you're not careful. So make sure you're not having that too close to your run. Sort of three to four hours before, ideally for me, is, is pretty ideal. Sometimes I push that a little bit. It can get nasty, it can get dangerous. Um, but the, the truth is you wanna go out and you don't wanna feel super light where you just feel a little bit faint and you feel a little bit dizzy because you just haven't fueled well, but you don't wanna feel that feeling where you're just so stuffed. You want a happy medium, ideally with a little toilet break uh, about an hour before you get out the door. So yes, eat before you run, but not too close to it. So oats about three hours before to four hours before, um, build up to that, don't do that as your first meal. It could get a little bit sketchy. I like toast, as I said, about an hour before. But have a bit of a look around. This is not a one size fits all recipe. Some people like a muesli bar, uh, some people like a heavier meal. Do your research, suss it out, find out what works for you. The truth is it's gonna be trial and error. I used to love wheat bix. I would eat wheat bix like they were going out of fashion and it just, it was a recipe for disaster with my running. So I've probably backed off a little bit in that department. Um, but yeah, if you, if you want something more substantial, let me, I'll, I'll add a few show notes uh, I'll, I'll add a few links in the show notes just to give you a bit of an idea of some other things that you can think about implementing and why. Um, but essentially, in a nutshell, I would say, uh, yes, eat, but keep it relatively light, especially close to your run the night before. Yeah, you should sure, go a bit heavier, maybe fuel up with some pasta, um, uh, fuel up with some carbs if, if that's what you sit well with. All right, here we go. Should I add distance? or speed. So let's imagine that you're, you're pretty fit. Let's imagine 
that you've built up a solid ability to run for a long period of time. The next question is, what are you training for? If you're running 60 Ks a week and it's all very slow and you wanna, wanna run a really fast 5K, then you wanna add speed. If you're training for an ultra marathon, I wouldn't stress too much about speed. It's not a really important factor unless you're trying to make difference, uh, like a, a bit of a difference in your technique and trying to improve your technical side of your running, which obviously I'm a big fan of. I would say, have a think about what race you're aiming for. If that race requires some more speed, obviously inject a little bit of speed. If that race requires more distance, focus more on that distance stuff. Then the question becomes, what kind of speed work should I be doing? And the truth is, it's not a one size fits all answer. There are many different track sessions from 200 meter reps to 400 meter reps to a variation of both of those things that you could do. If you want something more structured, the Relax Running Distance Members Toolkit has a, over 100 training programs there that you're gonna be able to choose from, uh, 100 training sessions to be able to choose from, which is gonna answer this in more detail. The goal is, uh, whatever race it is that you're you're training for, practice running at a pace which is slightly faster than that a couple of times a week with some recovery days in between. So maybe you're training for a, a 5K race. Well, on a Tuesday and a Thursday, inject some sessions into your weeks which, uh, which are faster than the pace that you plan to run with some recovery days in between. The idea there is you wanna be comfortable running at your 5K goal race pace. You don't want the day of your race to be the first time you've tried to run that fast because Mentally, that's just a hard thing to manage for 12 and a half laps on the track or you know, 5Ks out on the road. So just really work at that. Uh, but as I said, essentially it comes down to what distance you're training for uh, and then what is a little bit faster than that. If you need more guidance, check out the Relax Running Distance Toolkit. Should I run every day? Well, this depends on who you are. For some athletes, I would say 100% you should. And for a lot of other athletes, I'd say don't even think about it. If you're brand new to running, I'd say don't even think about it. Your goal is just to try and build up that ability to run two or three times a week. If you can do that, that's a really good place to start. If you're training for a marathon, you're quite competitive, I would say, yeah, okay, you should be thinking about trying to work towards training every single day. It all comes down to, much like the last question I just answered, it all comes down to what is your overall goal? Are you trying to qualify for the Olympics? Uh, are you trying to qualify for you know, an inter-club meet? What is your goal? How much do you need to run? And then break it down from there. Have you got a history with injury? Have you got a, a, a history of you know, breaking down or plateauing or just getting tired? If any of these things are problems, if you're coming back from an illness, it's not all black and white with distance running. There's a lot of gray in between. So if you don't have a coach, I would encourage you to get a coach, get a mentor, reach out to me with more specific details as to what it is that you're experiencing, as to your struggles, as to your breakthroughs, and, and, and let someone who's got experience in the field guide you in this department. There's honestly no point guessing your way through it because there's so many people who have gone before you who have made the, uh, have made the same mistakes that you're probably going to make if you're, you're guessing your way through it. So, hey, save yourself a heap of time, save yourself a heap of effort, reach out to someone for a little bit of guidance as to how much you should be running for where you're at and how to build that up over time. All right, uh, what are the right running shoes for me? I answered that in the first question, a, sh a shoe which suits your particular kind of foot. Go and see a podiatrist to find out exactly what that is. What if I have to go to the bathroom? Okay, so early in my running career, in fact, probably far too late into my running career, this is a lesson I just didn't learn for whatever reason. If you're out in the bush, you gotta do the bushman squat. Too bad, it's just the way it is. Uh, we've all been there. I remember one day I was running in Ringwood here in Victoria and uh, it was just off a bike path and I went to go up this little dirt trail uh, to, uh, to follow out to a trail that I really loved and this poor bloke, he was right in the middle of the dirt trail. He thought he had just dodged all the traffic and he was mid squat. He, uh, he had this problem and we looked at each other. I looked at him, didn't even judge him because I was like, mate, I've been there a hundred times. The poor bloke was so embarrassed. So don't be like him. If you're worried this is gonna be an issue, plan your run with some toilet breaks around you. It's not that complex. Plan your run so that an hour before you get to go to the loo. Make sure that somewhere in your run there's a McDonald's, there's a KFC, there's some bush, there's a public toilet. It's, it's common sense really, but the ultimate goal is just try and figure out an eating plan which is gonna allow you not to need to go to the toilet so much. Where do I run is the next question. 
Well, that depends on what you like. I was running around the suburbs in the city for, for years and personally got a little bit over it. Now I'm just making the most of just behind me out here, well, there's a wall and then there's a road and then there's the beach. And along that beach, there's a, there's a bike path. I run a whole heap along that now. Um, there's also a path back there called Lover's Track. It's like a soft sand path, which can be a little bit challenging. I enjoy that. I also love in the city, uh, sorry, out in the Dandy, I was getting up to the Yarra Ranges, up to, what's it called? Um, Sherbrooke Forest is, is where a lot of runners run. Truth is, you can run wherever you want. I like to get a little bit of a balance between different surfaces. A little bit in the suburbs, a couple of bike paths here and there. Some really soft trails are probably my favorite. I like just to hit nature and, and just really escape from some of the noise, leave my headphones at home. Um, that's a personal preference. There is no right or wrong answer to that question. Just what do you like? Okay, go and run there. If it makes it more enjoyable or more appealing, well, that's, that's where you should run. I would just encourage you, run with people if you can. Uh, a lot of the time, it can get really lonely wherever you run. So a few weeks ago out here, uh, Dave McNeil, who's a, a two-time Olympian here in Australia, he lives, oh, his parents have a holiday house about 1K down the road there. And uh, he was there and he messaged me to let me know he's in town and I was so stoked. I ran with him, I ran a bit faster because I was trying to impress him, the conversation was better. It was just a more enjoyable experience. So I took a mental note that this has to happen more often. So I've made a bit of a personal preference, a little bit of a personal goal to, to make sure I do that. All right, can I drink coffee before I run? Well, you can if you're playing with fire. This toilet topic's coming up a lot today. I don't like to have a coffee closer than an hour before I run, and even then, I like a little espresso shot. So that's a personal preference. The espresso shot sometimes just help flush the shit, flush, wow, I'm struggling with that word, flush the system. Sorry for the graphic images here, guys, but distance running, not a glamorous sport. So, hey, this is what we're working with. Um, personal preference. If you've got irritable bowel syndrome or just a real sensitive stomach, don't do it, but just use some common sense. That's what a lot of this comes down to. And uh, this is a random question, but it came up more than I imagined. Can I run with a cold? If it's a mild cold, I would. I'm a little bit obsessive. If I'm not exhausted, if I feel like it's just a bit of a nose run, maybe a very slight cough, I'll usually get out there and run. That's such bad advice in this COVID world though, isn't it? People are sensitive to that these days. If you've got, if you've got COVID, don't run, you'll get arrested. If you've got a mild cold, your body's not fatigued, you're not exhausted, get out there for a run if you want. But just go slow, don't be silly. Um, uh, I met a bloke the other day here in, in Queenscliff. He told me he hadn't missed a day of surfing since 2014 because he's obsessed. Now, there's a lot of runners who are wired that same way. If that's you, okay, welcome to the club. You're in a good sport. However, don't let, uh, don't let your OCD get in the way of a really good performance. OCD can be the number one ingredient to getting you injured, the number one ingredient to getting you fatigued, the number one ingredient to making you more sick. So I just wanna caution what I just said with, I think I've got a pretty good gauge of, of how serious uh, whatever fever or cold or where, whatever it is that I have is. So uh, I'll often know if I'm getting really sick, I won't run, or if I'm just mildly sick, I'll, I'll, I'll get out for a little bit of a jog. So it's just a mild caution. Don't run if you're exhausted. If you think you're gonna be okay, hey, just still take a little bit of caution. We've come to the end. There are a heap of questions. That was 15, 15 or so questions that we got through there. So hey, if you've got any more questions that you'd like to know, if there's any other way I can help, uh, reach out to me. I'm relaxed running, uh, shoot us a message. That's me responding, more than happy to help where I can. Jump on the Relaxed Running Forum, forum.relaxedrunning.com. If you've got any, any concerns, any questions, if there's any other way that I can help, please let me know. Um, guys, also, a little, bit of a, a little bit of news for you. Over the last few years, I've been spending a lot more time really focusing on the, the world of running technique. It's something I've been fascinated by since I was about 14 years old. I've, uh, I've really delved into it. I've loved looking at the elite performers, uh, so I'm, I'm creating a technique analysis part of the website. So if you're interested in getting a little bit of technique analysis done, I'd be more than happy to guide you guys through it. Shoot me a message on the platforms that I've mentioned earlier. Uh, I'll let you know when that's up and running, uh, where you can submit your videos to, how you can submit those videos, and, uh, and together we can work, work through making you a more effective and efficient runner. Because in the world of distance running, it's obviously a hugely important skill to develop. In sports like swimming and golf, it's, uh, it's 
it's second nature. We just know that they're so important. But for whatever reason, a lot of us have forgotten about the importance of running techniques. So I'm here to help you guys change that, fix that. So if that's something that you need a bit of guidance with, please hit me up on those platforms earlier. But guys, that's all I wanted to share with you today. I hope that was helpful. I hope that's helped clarify a few of your concerns or questions that you might have. Essentially, guys, keep showing up. It's gonna get easier with time. You'll get more confident with time. And before you know it, if you can keep showing up, you're gonna be a, a far more impressive athlete in 12 months time than what you are today. But uh, the ingredient that a lot of us miss is impatience. So be patient, show up daily, do the little things, recover well, and uh, you're gonna see some really big breakthroughs. But hey, I hope you enjoyed that. Until next week, I'm out of here. Make sure if you're listening to this, you go and check out the Relax Running YouTube channel and uh, yeah, share a little bit of love over there. All right, happy running guys, and I'll speak to you all next week.